welcome again to another study and uh, as you all probably have already know the lockdown has been extended uh, mm -hmm. right up to 3rd of may so we are obviously going to do these uh, online meetings uh, you know uh, definitely until then and uh, probably even uh, beyond that uh, in different ways so uh, uh, let's uh, i'm glad that we can continue to use this uh, medium to be able to communicate um, i i'm presuming that everybody has a fairly good bandwidth um, many a times i see some whose bandwidth tends to drop but uh, but i hope that you don't miss out on anything uh, by the way this is not being live streamed through youtube does it is it no okay. so uh, uh, but this ca this can be recorded and then yeah. also we are we are recording it so that uh, we can share it with people uh, who missed it okay well uh, going back to what we had uh, started off with today i want to complete the section 1 and uh, let me complete the points right up to 1.18 and then uh, we will do a little summary of what we have learned so i'm going to pick up from 1.14 um, i think it is necessary for us to recognize uh, god's redemptive act and why god would be a redeeming God. Uh, so let me read the question in 1.14 where it says, why did the triune God redeem creation? And the answer given is, from the beginning, God's human creatures in, distrust, uh, in distrusting God have alienated themselves and sought to live autonomously from their good, faithful and life-giving creator. But because the triune God is a faithful and loving God who does not give up on his creatures, God himself made a way for them to be reconciled to him and thus return to fullness of communion with him as their Lord and Savior. Uh, just to pick up once again a few points from there, notice redemption comes from God. Alienation came from us. We decided to alienate. In the futility of our mind, we thought that we could do better without God. We decided to depart from Him. We decided to not depend on Him. And so, uh, in our alienation, we tried to do things autonomously. But notice, God comes back to redeem us. Right? Um, he himself makes a way to be reconciled to him. And we know how that was done. And we have uh, gone through that whole scenario last week in the Passion, uh, in, the Good, in the Good Friday service, as well as the Resurrection. We have seen how he found a way to redeem humanity. And now the question I want to ask is, why? Why would God be a redeeming God? Why would he pursue redemption? Why doesn't he just leave creation to its own whims and fancies? Uh, like some theology state, there is a theology called deism, which basically says that God is no more interested in the world. Yes, he created it, but now he's left it to its own fate. And uh, the creation flounders. It just decays and God is not bothered one bit but that's not the god we worship the triune god that we worship uh comes after us is a redeeming god he redeems the alienation and gives us a, a, a way to come back to him uh so uh he does it in a way where we can have someday the fullness of communion with him uh, he doesn't want half measures. He is not interested in just, you know, uh, a namesake reconciliation. But his reconciliation is so deep that he would go 
to the depths of hell through the incarnation and through the death on the cross he would go to the depths of hell to redeem us completely fully as one theologian said it's like you know taking you know uh, we, we we wear socks uh, when you want to invert the socks you put your hand right inside and catch the tip and pull it out and so it comes out completely and so uh, that's the redemptive uh, you know uh, uh, attempt that god has made he redeems us fully now just to leave with you leave you with one more point uh, why is this all happening because the triune god is a faithful and loving god his love he is love and his love uh, is what inspires faithfulness the love that he has for us uh, you know allows him or uh, brings him to a point of being so faithful to us that he redeems us and so you notice that we constantly come back to who is this god right you remember i mentioned something about uh, the necessity for us to know who god is we will do a summarization a little, little later on that uh, it all points to the god who is a god of love all of this all his acts are uh, something to do with his very essence with his very nature which is love okay having said that let's move to point 1 uh point 1 5 um and the question in point 1 5 reads why does the triune god now work to perfect the creation and the answer is because the triune god is a communion of perfect holy love who created us to share in the triune god's love and life for all eternity and in that way give glory to god so um uh just to bring some clarity there um notice god is willing to share in the triune god's love he created us so that we can share in him in his love in his uh you could say in his life in, in in the dynamic life that the triune god is um god only lives in loving ways because he is love and that love is what forces him to perfect the creation the perfection of the creation is a pursuit of a loving god and his love is perfect the perfect love is what makes him to uh, pursue humanity right and uh, bring them to a complete union with him and all of that uh, ultimately ends up in glory to god uh, you know because god uh, god is good and our uh, our glory or our giving of glory is not necessarily to add anything to him i think like we discussed last time but it is for our own good as we share in his love as we share in his union as we share in his perfect redemption and as we participate in that we are in one sense glorifying god you know uh it is it 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 sort of reinvigorates us it revitalizes our us it is like you know just to give you an example we obey our parents and uh, why do we obey our parents many a times you might think it is for the good of the parents but that's not true we obey our parents because it is for our own good so we glorify god we worship god not because god is getting something out of that but it's because we ourselves are you know being uh, living in a sense of well being as we live in the glory of god okay um 
Now I am going to, uh, let me see. Okay, let me read 1.16 and I will then uh, skip over 1.17, but let's, let's read 1.16. And the question there is, how can we finite creatures know, love, and trust the triune God? And the answer to that is, the triune God has the desire, will, and ability to make himself known to his human creatures who do not have the desire, the will, or the ability to know God on their own. That revelation, which culminated in the Father's personal revelation in Jesus Christ, has, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, been preserved for us in the Holy Scriptures. Where you will very clearly notice once again, a, 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 the triune aspect of that self-revelation. God reveals himself as the Father in Jesus, through Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit. And that's the reason why this whole triune nature is so very much a signature throughout all the scriptures uh, and we see that from time and time again and that's the reason why we believe and trust God to be triune. Now uh, one important point we need to keep, keep in mind we did not find God. We cannot find God. Right? I hear sometimes some people say oh at last I found God. Um, well, I don't think we have the ability to find God. It is the other way around. God found us uh, and he made it possible for us to approach him in Jesus Christ or through Jesus Christ, I should say, in the Holy Spirit. Uh, we would not even have the will or the ability or rather the desire, I should say, uh, to know God. But we, uh, uh, in Christ, through Christ, have been given the channel, the way. Remember, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It is only through him we have been able then finally to be able to come to understand and know God. So, um, it is through revelation. Uh, that's the reason why we believe that this knowledge that we have of God is only through revelation and not through any kind of self-discovery. Uh, even though we might go through self-study or we might study things, but nevertheless, it requires revelation for us to know God and to finally understand who he really is. Okay, we will then, uh, I will skip one 1 1.17 and go to 1.18. This is the last point in this particular uh, section and uh, after that we will just go through a summary in 1.18 the question reads what do Christians understand from the Holy Scriptures about the character of the triune God revealed by Jesus Christ and that's the final question uh, to the question that we posed and we continue to pose who is this God right what do we understand about God from the Holy Scriptures and the answer reads as follows we learn that the character mind purpose will and heart of the triune God is identical to what we see and hear in Jesus Christ demonstrated by what he accomplished in his earthly ministry those who have met and seen the son have indeed met in him the father we know the Father by knowing the Son. They are united in such a way that they have the same nature, character, heart, mind, will, authority, power, and purpose. That's, uh, that's a lot of words there, but, uh, you know, I can, uh, let me re refer to one scripture talking about that oneness that we have and we see in the triune God which Jesus claims came to reveal in John chapter 10 and in verse 30 uh, it says I and the father are one and when he says that he means a lot when Jesus says I and the father are one reading from John 10 and verse 30 
uh, he means that they are united, like the last sentence says, they're united in such a way that they have the same nature, character, heart, mind, will, authority, power, and purpose. And so Jesus Christ couldn't be anything less than the Father in that sense. They share the same uh, nature and uh, are co-essential in that, in that regard. Uh, so that oneness is in every aspect, uh, in being, in character, in attributes. And so that is why Jesus becomes the perfect revelation of God. Like it says in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, he is indeed the, you know, the perfect representation of the glory of God. And so Jesus Christ uh, in his humanity, in the incarnation, shows himself or rather uh, helps us to understand who God is. What we'll do now is just go through a summary and pick up some essential points if I can request uh, uh, Praveen to put up a slide and I'm hoping that you can all uh, see it. Uh, can you all uh, see that? Right. I'm just trying to. Okay. Section one, it's uh, the triune God, a summary. So let me just take each point and I can make uh, some comments as we go along. The first point is God is one divine being. Now, this is a summary of what we have learned in this particular section. God is one divine being in three eternal, co-essential, distinct persons, Father, Son, Spirit. I hope none of us have a doubt on that. And like I said, it, it, you know, it, it so very much comes out uh, in the scriptures that there is, uh, you know, this one God represented or manifesting himself as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That is, seems very, very clear to all of us. Remember, they are eternal. They are, they are God. Uh, they had no origin. They, had, they were not created. Uh, they share the same essential being. But they have, uh, you know, they are Father, Son, Spirit. Point two says one God not three gods. Uh, so we don't believe in polytheism. We don't believe in multiple gods. Uh, we need only, we, we have only one God, but that God we know is Father, Son, Spirit. Uh, they are not three masks, like we explained in uh, one of our sessions. Uh, it is not one person appearing as Father at one time, Son at another time and the Spirit at yet another time. No, they are three of them are distinct, so they are not three masks. Right now, just to once again reiterate, it's all beyond reason and logic. Sometimes we are not able to fully fathom this, and that's the reason why we have to be careful uh, what kind of um, uh, illustrations we use. Some illustrations are not very accurate. For example, many times some people use uh, water, ice, and steam to try to prove that God is one. Uh, but once again, that can have the problem of going back into, uh, you know, Sabellianism or modalism with the three mask problem. Uh, so we have to be careful what kind of illustrations we use to represent God. Point number three here, God is triune, right? And that's the reason why the early church fathers used the word Trinity or from the Latin Trinitas. Now, I think you all know, don't be surprised that this word is not in the Bible. The word Trinity or Trinitas is not in the Bible. Uh, but it is clearly revealed that God is triune. Now, some people might say, well, I don't believe in the Trinity because the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Neither is the word incarnation. Right. But we use that word to depict, to describe, to explain something uh, which we find very much in evidence in the scriptures. So we use the word Trinity not because it is found in the Bible, 
only because it explains something which is very clearly given in the scriptures. So that's the reason why we say God is triune. Let me go to point, the next point. This God is revealed through in the scriptures as love. God is love, as John tells us. The very essence of God is love. And uh, that is something vital for us to recognize. It is because of God being love that we have a sense of hope. Otherwise, uh, you know, um, we would be devastated if we have a God that sometimes is depicted, you know, even by Christians to depict God as less than being love. And so we have to be very careful of that. We can unpack that a little bit, go along in many of the other studies. Now, God is love, and the next point says God is personal, right? Uh, one of the things that we recognize from God being love is personal, and that's the reason why we can have a relationship with him. If God is impersonal, you cannot have a relationship with an impersonal force. You cannot have a relationship with something that is, uh, you know, an it. Uh, but God is personal. And so, but once again, we have to be careful that we don't reduce God to a human. Uh, there is a personality with God that gives us the ability to have a relationship with him. And that is uh, another very vital revelation that we are given in the scriptures. The next point talks about his oneness, one will, one mind, one love. Not only is he one being, there is only one God, but Father, Son, Holy Spirit have one will, one mind, one love. In other words, there is no conflict within themselves. There is no, uh, you know, deviation or argument between them. They all have a oneness uh, and they support that oneness in a, in, in a very dynamic way. Uh, maybe we will talk about that sometime down the line. And in this section, we also learned about creation. Going to the next point. Creation is the overflowing, sharing love of God. Not because God needed human beings. Uh, God is uh, perfect within himself. There is nothing that can be added to make him more perfect. And so the creation was not brought into being only to bring any kind of perfection to God. God is perfect within himself. But creation is the overflowing and the sharing love of God. He is so magnanimous that he brings creation into being only so that that creation can enjoy the joy and the, and the, and the, and the love and, of course, the dynamic life that they themselves have as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And coming to the last point, who God is should be the primary question, like I said many a times before. So in this section, we have come to understand who God is. And like I say in that point, all other doctrines should be consistent with this. You see, when you don't know who God is, or when you describe God in the wrong manner, in the wrong way, what happens is many of our other doctrines will begin to uh, sort of move away from the centrality of who God is. Every doctrine that the Christian preaches and the Christian believes in must be consistent with who God is, that God is triune and that God is love. Uh, so anything to describe God in any other way can become a problem. And so that's the reason why we believe this is the fundamental doctrine on, upon which all other doctrines must align itself with. I think it is uh, Alistair McGrath, one of, a, uh, one of our modern day theologians, who said uh, this doctrine of the tri triunity of God is like a, the keystone 
Uh, he says you can describe it as a keystone or a foundational stone. You know, uh, the keystone, if you remember, like an arch, the keystone is upon which the arch is able to rest. The arch is able to stand because of the keystone in the middle. And that's how all other doctrines can stand. All other doctrines can uh, be valid only if it rests upon this fundamental doctrine of God being a triunity and God being love. So uh, that's basically what we understand from this particular section. So I think, uh, I'm not sure if uh, we have more time, but I think we will end there and then we will begin the new section, section two uh, next time.